Hi everyone. That's the same set. Thing. Thanks so much for joining us today for uh, manual testing board. and accessibility. Um, so we're be introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Khalid Musa. I'm an academic technologist focused on accessibility with the Office of Information Technology. I work with the team that brought Canvas to the university uh, as part of academic technology support services. My name is Luke Kudrashov. Uh, I'm the Senior Digital Accessibility Analyst at the Disability Resource Center, and I do a lot of consultations and uh, evaluations of uh, websites and software at the university, um, and yeah, I work a lot, uh, very closely with Khaled on a lot of different trainings, and we do offer, um, on a voluntary basis, audits uh, of websites, and we can help answer questions, and. Um, help with uh, kind of walking you through some of the things that we're talking about today. So feel free to reach out to us. We have um, our emails on the slide if uh, you would like help with that. Um, before we get started, just a few notes about access. Um, if you have any questions uh, come up during the presentation, we will make some time at the end for questions, um, but also feel free to um, speak up or raise your hands if you have any questions about what we're talking about kind of as we go. Uh, if there are any audio or visual issues, do let us know. And um, we have on the um, slide here two links. Uh, the first link is z.umn.edu slash manual dash testing dash slides if you want to follow along with the slides. Um, and the second link is z.umn.edu slash manual dash testing dash course. And that will take you to a uh, Canvas course that um, goes into a lot more detail about these tests and some other tests, uh, manual accessibility tests, that um, we won't have time to talk about in this presentation, but if you want to take a deeper dive, I would recommend checking that out. Our agenda today, we will start with a few um, accessibility principles, um, talk about why um, manual accessibility testing is important and how it differs from automated accessibility testing, understand the impact that it has, talk about a plan for how to approach starting to do manual accessibility testing on your websites, um, go through uh, demos of a few common um, kind of quick tests that you can learn and start uh, doing on your own, and then answer any questions that have come up. Um, so before we get started, can I have a show of hands of how many people uh, know about automated accessibility testing and have used that on their websites? Okay, so a, a pretty large number of you. That's good. How many of you have done any manual accessibility testing on your sites? Okay, so that's a pretty pretty good number. Um, what kind of test? What kind of manual tests do you do? Does anyone want to share? Screen reader with MBDA. Screen reader with MBDA. Yeah, great. Anyone else? Um, the, the keyboard and tabbing through the site. Uh huh. Yeah, keyboard manual testing, correct. Uh, yeah, so those are um, both uh, tests that we're going to uh, cover today, and we'll go through uh, Reflow and a couple of others as well. Um, so this is uh, just a list of some recommended tools. There are many different accessibility tools out there, so if you're already using something that you like, you can keep using that. Um, this is just some suggestions if you don't know where to start. So um, first, if you are uh, working here at the U, um, you should have access to Pope Tech, and we would um, recommend um, getting set up with that if you haven't already. Uh, if you don't have access to Pope Tech, it is um, using the WAVE tool, so you could use WAVE on your own. Um, you just have to do it manually on each site. Um, another automated tool uh, is Andy, um, that's quite popular, and the DQ Axe. Uh, so the slides have links to all of these, and uh, they're all free to use and set up. Uh, some common screen readers that are often used for accessibility testing are VoiceOver, if you have Mac or iOS, uh, NVDA on Windows, or also JAWS on Windows, and those links have uh, guides on how to get uh, started with those if you uh, aren't too familiar with screen readers yet. Uh, for keyboard accessibility, if you're on a Mac, you do need to um, change a few settings to make sure that you can actually um, test for keyboard accessibility on a Mac, so that uh, guide just um, walks you through how to do that. Then color contrast, we won't be talking much about that today, um, but I did want to share a couple of tools that I often use when um, I check color contrast that are really useful, so color contrast analyzer and the WebAIM contrast checker uh, tools I recommend. 
So we'll talk about the accessibility standard. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, specify four principles, P-O-U-R, and that's, uh, it stands for perce uh, perceptive, operable, understandable, and robust. And those means in English that the website or any um, thing you put on your website should be operable by every individual. Um, they should be able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interaction, and um, participate in the same services as equally as a, per a person uh, without a disability. So the having a disability is relevant in this case, but um, if you consider accessible design, accessibility is a technical term, so when we are specifying it, we'll talk about specific tests that you can do. From UX, the design, it's really important to keep the individual in mind, and that's where the inclusive comes. Uh, being inclusive is not, there is no technical standard that I can recommend for you. You have to think about the personalities of the different people that use your site and the different components that you're putting on your site. And if it, if it is providing a barrier for someone with a disability, then it's not an equal experience. And that's where that as equal as a person without a disability comes into place. We'll talk about um, uh, what is assistive technology. Assistive technology is just a tool software, a hardware that allows a person with a disability to participate equally in those services or acquire the information on a website or a kiosk or any device that you're working on. Um, it affords the person with a disability the same privacy a person without a disability has. A screen reader, for example, when you're typing a password, um, the person is able to type it independently and still uh, be able to interact with the password field the same way a person without a disability does. So it affords them the same uh, privacy at the same time. Types of assistive technology that we're going to be uh, might hint at or mention today depends on the disability, low vision, blindness, deaf or hard of hearing, learning disability, cognitive disability are some and each one has a specific tool or software that they might work with. We're not asking you to be an expert in knowing the assistive technology or how to work with it. Somebody might know how to work with NVIDIA or VoiceOver or um, JAWS as screen readers, but understand that the learning curve for those tools is very hard and someone with a disability takes a long, it takes them a long time to become comfortable with that software. Um, so don't blame yourself for not knowing those tools. It starts small, pick one technique that you're comfortable with learn how to listen to the screen reader or learn how to, to work with magnification because it's not easy. Nobody ever said it's easy. Um, a, a assistive technology is hard, but it's, for people with disability, it's not a choice. They have to use it. Um, it makes their life better, which means if you make your website work accessible, their assist, the assistive technology would work very good for web, with their website and gives them the same independence that they would like as a person without a disability. So we're going to shift to talking about um, the difference between automated and manual testing, and they really complement each other. It's um, good to have both in your um, accessibility testing strategy. And uh, here's why you might want to use uh, both of them. So automated testing just really reduces the amount of work, uh, manual work that you have to do instead of checking every single image, for example, whether it has um, alt text at all or whether alt text is missing, you can just run um, a scan and it'll identify all the places where there is no alt text. And same with heading structure and things like that. It just reduces the, um, the number of uh, manual things you have to pay attention to and it can also catch things that it might be easy for a person to mix, uh, to, to miss, for example, parsing errors in HTML, um, that can be really difficult for uh, a person to catch manually. Uh, but manual testing would also catch things that automated testing just can't. Um, automated testing tools, even the best of the tools, can only catch about 30 to 50% of issues, and it really depends on the complexity of the website. For a really complex website with a lot of JavaScript and ARIA, it might catch even less than that, so it is really important to um, do manual testing as well after you've done the automated testing just to make sure that um, the site actually does work because just fixing the automated issues isn't enough. Um, 
here's where to start um, for um, approaching, um, you know, testing uh, your site for accessibility. If you have a large site, you probably won't be able to test every single page, but um, just start with choosing a representative sample, include any templates that you use throughout um, all of your sites, uh, all of the different types of com components that people might uh, encounter. Uh, you might want to focus on kind of the most important content or the most viewed content since um, there's going to be a lot more people trying to access that. And yeah, develop um, kind of a, a testing strategy that's uh, really intentional and figure out how to prioritize your time. And in terms of uh, approaching the plan for um, how to go about testing, start with the automated testing so you don't do unnecessary work. Um, we're using Pope Tech here um, if you are a, a university developer and you have access to Pope Tech, but uh, this also applies to any other automated tool uh, that you use. If there are any errors that come up, there almost certainly are accessibility issues and you should try to fix them. Um, so start with that. And there is a documentation for Pope Tech or Wave that will help you learn how to use uh, those automated testing tools, what the um, issues mean, what kind of impact they have, and how you can go about fixing them. So start with that and then move on to the uh, manual accessibility testing. So we will now go through um, a few tests that uh, you can start with, uh, some of the kind of highest impact tests that um, uh, if you're just starting out with manual accessibility testing, you might want to prioritize. So first is reflow. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as responsive design. Um, this is the idea to make sure that um, a website can work on different sizes of uh, browsers and windows and different levels of zoom to make sure that it is uh, flexible to uh, whatever level of zoom and screen that someone is using. So and this is um, one way to test free flow. There are other ways. Um, this is kind of one of the most common ways is to set your viewport to 1280 CSS pixels in terms of the width. Uh, the height doesn't matter so much, just kind of keep it uh, fairly large. And I usually use um, this site that's called whatismyviewport.com, uh, kind of easy to remember, um, just tells you what the viewport is. There are other tools like plugins you can add that uh, will also help you do that. So you can just use whatever is easiest for you. And then you'll want to zoom in up to 400% uh, with that width on the screen. Um, and that will let you test um, how it's likely to reflow on mobile, although it's also good to double check on mobile, but also how someone with low vision who's using Zoom on a computer might encounter the site. And to zoom in on a browser, most browsers, it's um, control if you're on Windows or command if you're on Mac and um, the plus key. Um, and uh, you can also change that in the Zoom, uh, the browser settings too. And yeah, the content should reflow, and I'll um, do a couple of demonstrations of content that does reflow well and content that doesn't. Uh, and when you're doing this test, things to pay attention to is making sure that all of the information on the site is still uh, available, accessible, legible, and all of the functionality is still there, so the buttons don't get cut off. You're still able to you know, fill out drop-down fields um, those types of things. There are a few exceptions to content that um, th there's no way to really make it reflow well. So like things like maps, uh, videos, images, in some cases <coughs> data tables, or there, there are techniques for making data tab tables reflow. Uh, so there's just something to keep in mind that some things um, just uh, won't be able to reflow, but the majority of the content should. Um, so for an example, so first I will show you how to set the viewport. So this is um, the site that you use, and currently it's already set to 1280, but you can just drag the, the screen to um, make sure that it's set to 1280, so like that. And then I will go to, um, so this is an example where, so this is the site at regular 100% zoom. And if I scroll through, it's pretty easy to see there's different recipes. I can kind of see what all the recipes are click on the recipes. Um, it's pretty easy to navigate at, uh, you know, visually at um, regular zoom. But if I try to zoom in on this to 400%, so um, it doesn't it, it um, doesn't reflow to f uh, for all of the text um, to fit onto the screen. So I have to do both vertical and horizontal screening to um, actually access all of the content. 
like this. So um, this makes it really difficult for people with low vision, um, people who are using maybe screen magnification software or just um, you know zooming in on their screen, or even people who are on mobile to be able to figure out where they are on the page, like how many recipes are here, how what row am I in. It's really hard to keep track. Um, makes it really difficult to use a website. So that's something um, to keep in mind. If this happens, then um, that's something to look into and try to fix on your website. Um, try to make sure that it's, um, instead of having the three different columns, when the um, the, the screen with, uh, gets narrower, you would want to make it reflow into just a single column that um, takes up the whole screen. And now an example of what um, it looks like. So with uh, umn.edu, the, um, the main university website. So here, um, I'll just go through the website at 100% zoom. There are you know, buttons and content that does have multiple columns. Um, but then if I do, if I zoom in using control plus up to 400%, uh, so first you can see that the menu um, collapses, so um, you can just kind of collapse and um, expand it, so that makes it uh, easier rather than having to horizontally scroll through the whole menu. Um, you can just see it on your screen, but it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. And if I scroll down, these buttons uh, were in three different columns, but now they're reflow into a single column. So again, I don't have to scroll horizontally, I just uh, scroll vertically and I know exactly where I am on the page. Um, and same with here, this was in three different columns uh, and now it's uh, reflowed. Uh, the text is, it's increased in size and uh, you can, it's all legible, all of the buttons um, work. So this is uh, what you should be seeing um, when something is reflowing correctly. And some other things um, to keep in mind, sometimes um, content does reflow but then parts of it get cut off completely so you can't even access it with horizontal scrolling or um, you know the layout just gets really messed up so those are also some things that uh, can happen that, um, that you might want to look out for. How do you feel about the giant back to top kind of it seemed like it was blocking mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah that's a good question. Um, in this case, it's not. Sometimes you do see like huge banners that take up like half the the screen, and that's also an issue that um, that you would want to fix. In this case, yeah, it probably could um, be smaller. I don't think it it, it takes up a small enough um, portion of the page that it's uh, fairly easy to to ignore. I think, but it's maybe getting to the point where you might want to consider kind of um, making it smaller, collapsing that, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's a module, that's a Drupal module. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. Drupal module. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so something you can do is maybe, um, you know, if you wanted to, to make it a little bit um, easier is to kind of co collapse it instead of saying back to top, just kind of have a, a little arrow pointing to the top and then have it properly labeled for screen readers. Um, that would be a way to kind of, uh, make that smaller. Uh, the next test we want to talk about <laughs> is keyboard testing. And the way to do keyboard testing is, yeah, basically just throw your mouse out of the window. Pretend that you are not able to, don't touch your mouse at all, don't touch your trackpad, just use the keyboard. And are you still able to do all of the same things that you could if you were using a mouse? Are you still able to fill out the form? Are you still able to click all of the links? Are you still able to read all of the content? Um, because a lot of people are not able to use a mouse at all. They are um, reliant on the keyboard to, to navigate the site. And if your site is not accessible with a keyboard, they can't do anything on it. Um, these, when you're testing with a keyboard, these are kind of the main keys that you want to focus on. So tab will, um, should move forward through um, every uh, actionable item, like a link or a form field or a button. Uh, shift tab navigates backwards. The enter or the return key should open a link and activate buttons. Uh, spacebar should toggle checkbox values and activate buttons. And the arrow keys um, should be able to scroll the content, uh, move through, select radio buttons that are in a group. Um, and it can also sometimes move between interactive menu items or tab panels if you have any of those. 
Um, and when you're testing with a keyboard, here are a few important things to pay attention to. Uh, first is um, the is the way that the, um, the, the order that the uh, tab key moves through the page. Is it a logical order or is it jumping all over the place and kind of hard to keep track? Then is, um, can you see where the focus is at each time? Is if it's moving through um, the links or the buttons but it's not actually highlighting them or it's a really uh, low contrast focus indicator and it's hard to see where you are, it's not very usable even if you, you know, you can press enter on a link but if you don't know which link you're on it's not particularly helpful. Um, yeah, then uh, making sure that every actionable control uh, that works with a mouse also equally works with a keyboard. Um, that includes drop down menus and pop ups, making sure you're able to not just get to those but also uh, select a value that you um, that you need. And then making sure that there aren't any keyboard traps, so making sure that you are able to move through um, all of the links and kind of cycle through um, all of the interactive elements and that you don't get trapped um, and have to use a mouse to escape out of any element. And I will do a demo of what a keyboard trap looks like so um, you can get a sense of that. So um, this is just a demo site that has intentional keyboard trap set up. So if I start from the top, um, so far so good. It's on the first link. Uh, it's a good, clear uh, focus indicator. Then it goes to the, um, the next link and the second link. So far so good. But then I keep pressing tab, but it's not going anywhere. It's just stuck. And then if I click shift tab to try to go backwards, it still keeps me stuck. So if I'm a keyboard user, if I can't use a mouse, I just can't do anything else on the side. I'm just going to leave. Um, and then this uh, second example, so I can click out, but if I'm not use, able to use a mouse, then that's um, not going to work for me. And then with the second example, if I go into this first field and then press tab, so now I'm stuck in middle name again. I keep pressing tab and shift tab, and I can't get anywhere. And in this uh, case, it's coded in a way that I can't even, um, even if I'm pressing my mouse, I can't go anywhere. So uh, those are just uh, some ways that a keyboard trap can show up. Sometimes a keyboard trap um, won't be stuck on a single element, but it'll take you through a, a loop that doesn't take you kind of out of uh, a form field, for example, or um, kind of a set of links, so that can also be an issue. What causes these? Um, that's a good question. If you um, want to go through, I think it's um, something about tab indexes. It's There are different ways oh. to kind of cause it, but yeah, if especially setting like tab index order sometimes can really mess things up um, and okay. get you stuck in there and sometimes JavaScript can do that. Yes, yeah, so it's um, they do have the code here so you can um, really take a, a look and figure out what is happening there. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Most of those time, uh, time I've seen it in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then here's another example. Uh, this site doesn't have a keyboard trap, but it does have some other keyboard accessibility issues. So I'm starting from the uh, top now. I just opened this um, site, and I'm pressing tab to go to the first uh, actionable element. And I would expect to, oh, sorry about that. I would expect it to go to uh, this first link at a trip, or maybe a skip link at the top. But instead, it goes to this form kind of lower down on the right. To this, and not even to the first, um, you know, the um, first actionable element of this form, but kind of down here to book your trip. So it's kind of confusing. I'm not expecting that. Then I keep going. It goes to the next one. Um, keep going. Departure date. And something to keep in mind too is with these, um, the focus indicator is pretty faint here. It's kind of like a, a light blue. So this uh, black focus indicator is a lot better. So that's also something um, to keep in mind. And then. It just disappears. They don't even know where the focus indicator is anymore. Then it starts back at the top, uh, <laughs> find the pass. Then currently it's on this Facebook login button, but I don't see that it is. Like the only way I know is um, if I click it or if I kind of see what the link is and try to guess. But um, yeah, so it's very kind of confusing. Uh, sometimes it just totally disappears. Sometimes the focus <laughs> indicators are different styles. They kind of go all around the page. So if I just keep going, so now it does cycle through the way I expected for a bit, but then it disappears again. And I'm just gonna keep going. You know, I'm just like pressing the tab key and I have no idea where I am on the page. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm back. 
Um, is this a real site? This is a demo site. This is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what they're selling here. Yeah. Uh, we, we intentionally didn't want to call anyone out with the inaccessible example, so we're choosing demos that were intentionally created to be uh, inaccessible. And then I'm back at this form, and then I'm going through some of the form fields, but again, not in order. So if I was using a keyboard to try to book a trip, I, uh, I mean, technically I could because it does go through every single element, but I'd have to fill it out out of order and press the tab key like 100 times to get through all of it, so I'd probably give up and not want to actually book a trip on this site. So that's um, some other issues that can come up when you're doing uh, keyboard testing to keep in mind. And then looking for kind of what you should be expecting to see is, so the skip link we'll talk about um, in a little bit. But then it um, goes through kind of left to right, um, top to bottom, which is um, on English speaking side is usually what you would expect. And there's a kind of a clear uh, outline around each one. It's going in the order that I expect. Um, and if I um, was to be testing more, doing more thorough testing, I'd want to make sure that the links actually open, all the buttons actually work, um, just to show the, the focus order um, and kind of an intro. Testing, it's pretty clear where I am on each side, and it's kind of going through in the order that I would expect. So this is kind of what you would want to see if you were doing testing. And this impacts keyboard-only users. It also impacts screen reader users. Um, a lot of the time, screen reader users will also be using the keyboard to inter interact with the page. And various other assistive technologies also use kind of keyboard controls. So it does impact a lot of users. Um, the next test that we want to move um, towards is um, skip links and landmarks. Uh, and those are kind of related because a skip link leads to a landmark. Um, so the, the main things that you want to check is that all of the content on your site, um, except for the skip link, the skip link is allowed to be outside of a, a region landmark, but everything else should be contained in the landmark. Um, the skip link should be leading to the main content of the region. The point of the skip link is that a keyboard user or a screen reader user can jump to uh, directly to the main page without having to t uh, tab a bunch of times through the navigation and figure out how to get to the main content. Especially if someone is using the same site with the same navigation, they probably just want to be getting to the main content quickly instead of going through the same uh, navigation each time they open a new page. Uh, some HTML tags are already identified as region landmarks automatically uh, by assistive technology. You don't necessarily need to add a new ARIA role attribute. Um, for example, uh, the main HTML tag automatically assigns a role main. Uh, you can also add it manually, but you don't have to. Um, but you can also, if, um, if the site is already set up in a way that uh, restructuring the HTML would be really difficult, you can also just add an ARIA role attribute instead and it'll have the same function. And yeah, some common uh, regions that are usually included on a site is uh, main for the main content, the navigation, and you can have multiple navigation roles. Um, if you have multiple, um, you know, navigate, if you have like a, a secondary navigation and a primary navigation, but you would want to have separate ARIA labels for those. Um, a content info or footer, uh, and a banner or header. And there are also some optional uh, additional regions, for example, um, article and complementary that you don't have to use, but you can to, to structure the site more. And just to show uh, what the landmarks look like, because usually they're hidden, only uh, assistive technology users would um, be able to actually uh, see where the landmarks are. But this um, uh, W3C site uh, just kind of visualizes what, um, what the structure is like. So, uh, you know, this top area is the, the banner. Um, there's a, a navigation, kind of this is the main navigation. There is also, their skip link isn't a navigation in this case because there it's a more complex skip link. That's not necessary. You can have just a skip to main link. Most pages would just have that. Then there's kind of the main content and there's um, a subregion, so you are allowed to nest them. So in this case, there's a region um, that's kind of identifying a separate section under main. And then there's complementary. That's not quite the main content. Um, and um, it just lets people know that there's kind of like some site content that they might want to look at. So there's two complementary regions, and uh, many. Oh, and then there's a content info kind of footer at the bottom. 
So now we are move to the screen reader test. Um, so far, uh, you've seen a lot of tests that you can perform on your own. Um, so I'm going to move this computer out of the way. Linario Landmark Example dash Google Chrome title bar. Escape. We're not expecting you to um, become proficient at a screen reader user, to be a screen reader user in the Canvas course that we shared, which is again z.umn.edu forward slash um, manual dash accessibility dash course. We have a few resources um, similar to what these slides do, but also a screen reader command cheat sheet. Um, you'll find a lot of those on the web. We developed one in-house for the University of Minnesota with a lot of uh, keyboard um, commands that you could use for reading speci specifically um, to read paragraphs, which you don't usually get with like the DQ University or the W3C list. Um, uh, so far, you've seen a lot of the, a lot of our slides. We d intentionally picked uh, demo sites that kind of give you a good picture. This test that is in the W3C to highlight your regions, you can use the Andy tool that would surface your regions on the website. The Andy is A N D I. It's a Chrome extension um, JavaScript that you can that you can bookmark and it will surface all of these uh, things on your website and help you pick a few things that are um, an actual wave test will not pick up um, because you get to visualize the regions and the headings the same way. So with a screen reader test, there are screen reader co keyboard commands that I'm going to be using. I'm just going to show you the benefits of those. So Luke was mentioning uh, the main navigation. In this case, it's... Uh, 3 of 30. There is no main region on this page. Drupal manual testing dash Google slides. Drupal ma landmark. Main region. So the letter Q in a JAWS screen reader jumps to the uh, main region directly. I don't need to go to the skip link. Somebody who's using voice to command will Skip have to, to navigate, um, press tab to get to the first element. F typically the first tab on your website should be the skip link. If you click it, it should go to the main. But a screen reader user does not need to do that. If you have a main region, the letter Q will skip um, automatically. So in this case, um, I can surface all the regions. There is a keyboard command for that as well. And I can Log. jump to the navigation system. main open level level zero so i can surface all those regions for me if i'm testing them and that's again a very complex keyboard command you don't need to know it but if you want to do it in this fashion without a screen reader use the andy um, the letter r for regions using a screen reader does go to the next region shift r goes to the ne the previous region um, again this is only to help you understand is this the structure you intended besides main everything else is optional do you need to have a header do you need to have a navigation do you need to have a footer do you need to have a content info and how many of each in order to know that structure um, you need to know, make sure that's the, your intention if that's not your intention and some marks got added without your knowledge from a migration that you've done or from a previous different platform that you've used, you might want to delete those if that's not your intention. Again, besides the main, um, typically the rest are optional, but if you do have a header and a footer, then add a header and a footer region. If you have a navigation uh, section of your website, then add that. So in this case, I'm going to keep this open and we're going to Dash go Google's. to the Space, speech on demand. I'm not going to bother you with the screen reader too much, but in the next one, we'll talk about heading structure, which is typically the first primary method for navigation for somebody using a screen reader or um, voice to text, voice to speech, text to speech uh, software. They rely on that heading structure to understand the content of your website. Heading one is the title of the page. Everything is a level two for sections. Subsections of two are threes. So it should follow, it should be succinct and to the point. It should be titles, each heading structure, not paragraph. Do not make a whole paragraph um, a heading structure. Don't just bold it 
for visual look, add the H tag in HTML, and that's really important because more than 70% of assistive technology users use heading navigation as their primary navigation. Headings are beneficial for all, that's why you make it bold and you make it stand out, but also for uh, search engine optimization, that's what they look for to understand what sections you have in your pages, the headings and those landmarks. So in the next one, we'll... Uh, the example? Yeah. For, for regions? Each uh, heading. Oh. Use slide 20, slide... But Commuter that, navigation that landmark colon area. So in, the, in here, there is a heading structure example too. This button wrapping to talk, skip to content, show landmarks, hide head, enter, show headings, enter. So you can show the headings, and here it shows the heading. I also can show you the same thing with a screen reader. Head navigation design H design. So I can skip to the different headings, but the if the letter R was for regions. Do you want to guess what keyboard command is for headings? Activate. Yeah, there you go. It should make sense. Um, most of the time, screen reader commands if for graphics, uh, G. For um, check boxes, it's X because it's X to check it. Uh, um, radio buttons is A. It's from the, the R is already taken for region, so they took the next letter, which is A. <laughs> um, but it. It makes sense for somebody learning a screen reader, right? So you have to keep that, per that personality in mind. That's what they're relying on to navigate those web, the, those web pages. So I'm going to close this page for now. And Colin, travel to Mars. No, we don't want to travel to Mars. Close document. <laughs> um, it's a very, it's complex. So again, uh, um, heading level twos are sections of the page. Threes are section, sections of twos, right? So it should follow a heading structure. It should make sense to you surfacing those with the Andy again. If they're headings, Andy will surface it for you visually if you don't want to learn a screen reader. That's very helpful to know again, is that the structure you intended? No automatic tool will give, will understand what you intended to do with your structure. Is everything a two? Maybe not. Maybe some you intended to have three, but it was two by mistake and you might need to switch it. So, this 23,456,000 accessible university. So again, we relied on uh, other sources to kind of find examples that already exist at the University of Washington has a site here that has uh, a page with things that are bolded to look like headings, but not actual headings. So you can see they're bolded and made larger font-wise with a heading two, three, one, even the title of the page. So if I use the screen reader for headings to figure out how many headings I have here. Headings on this page. There are no headings on this. There is no headings on this page. Screen reader cannot detect any headings. But you can visually see there are some, right? Visually looking. Did so link here's enter. a corrected a version. A modern right? school. So Accessible university heading level one graphic. So you can make a graphic a heading one too. It doesn't have to be. Again, you, you, you decide what, what heading structure you intended to have. Um, the, the alternative text there is not uh, perfect, but... And Benito, can you spot the barriers? Heading O enrollment trends, O video, heading level two. So everything... Media player, three, heading level three. Um, and everything is the right structure, so I can surface my list of headings. Headings list B. Um, and again, Andy will do that visually for you. You don't need to have a screen reader or skills to do that, but if you do have the screen reader chops, it's even more powerful, so... Ex Welcome, Bienvenido. Can you spot O enrollment, O video call? So you see, I can navigate to the section I want. The screen reader will jump there just by picking the head. Media. Um, so again, more than 70% of peop uh, their people, their first primary navigation is heading um, I think the percentage of uh, primary navigation um, as a region was somewhere um, in 30%. So if we don't detect headings, the next thing we look for is regions as screen reader users. Window, Drupal manual testing dash Google, slide 27 of 38.5, forms alt text space, so we'll speech on demand. Forms next, and forms similar to what Luke was highlighting. Um, so the primary goal when you're testing for forms 
If you're using an automated tool, some things are easy to spot. Um, namely, a, an automated tool will be able to check if each field has a label or not. Um, sometimes I've seen uh, combo boxes refresh on selection or only accessible with a mouse. Sometimes those things, even though you coded it correctly, each field has a label, it has a title, it has an ID, but you're relying on mouse selection to do that, um, or uh, just by selection, the page refreshes. That's an absolute no-no in, um, in, in accessibility. And the only way to catch these is by actually testing your form and filling it out with a keyboard only test. So we're looking for focus, we're looking for reading order. So typically street is before the state and then state is before the zip code. You wanna make sure that tabbing order visually matches. If you could program it correctly, if the tab indexing is not correct, you wanna double check that with the keyboard. So the test is, I'm going to show you what the ND tool looks like in this case as well. This is eight. So here Rescue. M we have a, a, the ND tool has a, a, a page that has good and bad. So if you want to practice your skills, again, using a screen reader, both good and bad, and see how the ND tools or the wave tool or the axe tool or the site improve tool, whatever you're comfortable with, we're not recommending one tool. Actually, testing with multiple tools the same way you test with multiple browsers is always helpful. But in this case, you know, I'm gonna need rescuing. Dabbing. Edit re toolbar. toolbar main region. Who needs rescuing? Edit required has pop up. Top. So notice that it said edit field. It gives me the type of the field. The screen reader gives me what type of field it is. It gives me the label. Who needs rescuing? So you have to put your the name uh, the that person's name in. Pop-up, type the in text. next one. Who needs rescuing? Edit has pop-up. Notice it says edit, and it didn't read any label. You see a label visually, right? Mm -hmm. The screen reader cannot read it. The next one. MD, to change the... MD, but I don't know what MD is. Um, what am I selecting here? It's a combo box. It did say not an edit field, a combo box. And you can Type guess, if I want to navigate to that field specifically, again, edit field, combo box, um, which keyboard would skip to that directly, but... Edit has pop street, colon, edit. So in this case, so again, the first edit field was not bold, but in this case it is, it's street, because it, in, the, in this section it's the billing. Um, it would be helpful to add the billing to that label that you jump to a different section, but you, you don't have to. Um, at least it's reading. Wire has pop up. State colon Z colon edit required. So if I try to do the Andy, let's see if I can do it really quick. Bookmark other books. Add the text near the tab Andy. Come Andy. Enter. Leaving menu. Andy will surface a lot of things for you here. The cursor. Virtual PC tab order indicators. So you can do tab order indicators. Order ind Label tags toggle by enter. Label, Label tags. Tag. So it starts to highlight things for you. And again, you can start to confirm. It's a brow It's a bookmark. Um, it's really easy to add if you Google it. It's a. It, it's very simple and it's very powerful. Gonna. It, you can rely on that, and it'll give you the regions, the headings, the. And the Alt plus equals button. Advanced settings button. Enter. Expanded. Advanced Andy Hopkins list. But Andy help button. So there's a help, and you can test with that form um, to to see you, uh, if there is anything you, that would uh, help you. So up to this point, we have two more tests. I don't know if we have any. Um, I think we're out of time. But yeah. we, have, we do um, have if you want to open up the slides, um, there are more. We go into kind of some details about how to test tables and um, how to do uh, test yeah. contact structures. Any questions? Yeah, and if you have uh, a minute, please fill out our feedback form. That would be really helpful yeah. for us as well. It's the slash manual testing dash feedback. Yeah. Um, any questions? 
I was trying to get to the links, yeah, the Z links, mm -hmm. and I was having problems. I'm getting not founds, and so maybe mm -hmm. I was, I read the address wrong. Sli slide three of 38 accessible at if Sli yeah. Slide space, speech on demand. So manual dash accessibility dash slides. So manual dash testing. Dash testing. Uh, manual dash testing. Dash manual slides. dash testing. Dash slides. Or a dash course at the end. Z.umn.edu manual For, forward and manual slash is spelled with one N, yep. which is how I ha had it spelled. And it was working I go to now it, it now it did. I don't know what what it was. Then, there is. Okay, and then manual accessibility course. Manual testing. Manual dash testing. Course. So manual dash testing dash course. So all okay, these. and it's a canvas yep. course. Yeah, yeah. good. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. We make the screener look easy. Do not be told that. <laughs>